Hello everyone. My name is Carolyn Harley. I'm a singer-songwriter, storyteller, and late bloomer. And I fell in love with the story of the Famous Five when I first moved to Calgary back in 1986. And I started teaching preschool at Nellie McClung Elementary School. Uh, a few years later, I was part of a project to celebrate Calgary's 100th anniversary. And so I researched Nellie McClung and the Famous Five to write a song for that project. And that's when I became a great fan of these five amazing Alberta women. I was impressed by their determination in the face of adversity and disappointment. And I loved how they worked together in spite of the fact that they didn't agree with each other on all the issues of the day. And lastly, I was very impressed with the fact that they were late bloomers. These were not young women when they set out on this journey to personhood, but they persevered, they worked together, and they finally won the person's case. And this decision changed the definition of the word person in the BNA Act to include women. And what an amazing accomplishment. And so in honor of the Famous Five, this is my song, The Ballad of the Famous Five. a place in the history of Canada's nation. The famous five changed the face of our land. They were born in a time that seemed so benign, when ladies were seen but not heard. Heroes of mine, the famous five. Well, welcome. Bienvenue. Thank you for joining us on this Famous Five Friday, a Friday where women have extra powers and see more possibilities, more opportunities. Thank you for joining us from across Canada once again. Um, of course, I should start by acknowledging the wonderful song, The Ballad of the Famous Five, written and sung by Carolyn Harley. 
and she will be back at the end of the program to sing her Spirit of the Famous Five. Both these songs, I hope you will learn the words to and then just sing along. While we are not forgetting to remember the innocent children who went to residential schools or who were buried in unmarked graves or the policies that led to those tragedies. This past three, four days has been an incredible historic um, two occasions. First of all, on Wednesday, Prime Minister Trudeau announced the appointment of Mary Simon as the very first Indigenous Governor General. Oh, what a magnificent appointment. Our um, Famous Five chapter in Ottawa several years ago honoured Mary as a nation builder. And so we are very happy to be reconnecting with her in her new role. And then yesterday, another breakthrough, or as uh, Roseanne Archibald says, another, grass, another glass ceiling cracked when she became the first female chief of the Assembly of First Nations. Terrific. Yay, Rox Roseanne. So we hope to become friends with you too, Roseanne, in the very near future. So lots of achievements for women, this time by Indigenous women, but of course it reflects on all of us, on the boys and girls and on the men and women of Canada. So today I'm pleased to introduce Gina Jordan, who will be introducing our talented panelists from the world of tech and also finance. Gina is the new manager of corporate citizenship at Enbridge and has been instrumental in their developing and now implementing their new governance model, which she will tell you just a little bit more about, which affects all the Enbridge employees across North America. As part of Gina's responsibilities, she has the corporate investment portfolio at Enbridge. And so on behalf of the Famous Five Foundation and hundreds of other charities across Canada, we say thank you to Enbridge and thank you very much to Gina. Just recently, Gina has been nominated for the national award given to professionals in the community investment field. It's called the Hazel Gillespie Community Investment Leadership Award. So here's hoping Gina is recognized in this regard, but today she is going to introduce us to our talented panel. And so Gina, it's over to you. And again, thank you very, very much, Enbridge and Gina. Thank you, Francis. It is such an honor to be here today on behalf of Enbridge. We've been a proud supporter of the Famous Five Foundation for nearly 20 years, and we truly believe in and support the Foundation's vision to champion the development and recognition of Canada's female leaders. And we share this goal within Enbridge and continue to work on our commitment to diversity and inclusion as part of our environmental, social and governance or ESG targets. In late 2020, Enbridge added inclusion as one of our core values, complementing our existing values of safety, integrity, and respect. And we continue to increase female representation at senior levels. Today, 36% of our board of directors are women, and 31% of all leadership roles are held by women. And we're proud of this, but we know that we have further to go which is why we're working to increase representation of women, underrepresented racial and ethnic groups, indigenous peoples, veterans, and people with disabilities. In addition, Enbridge is taking its leadership role in ESG to a new level with the introduction of our first sustainability-linked bond. These bonds, a first for the midstream energy sector in North America, directly link our financial strategies to our ESG goals. And this tie, along with our connecting ESG goals to incentive compensation, shows that we're serious about meeting our targets and continuing to be a leader in the ESG space. 
it is now my great pleasure to introduce two super talented female leaders, the co-CEOs of The 51, Judy Fairburn and Shelley Kuypers. Judy Fairburn has forged a career at the leading edge of collaborative innovation as a senior energy executive, recently as chief digital officer and EVP of business innovation, co-founder of Evoke Innovations, an entrepreneur-led corporate venture fund, and as the co-founder and inaugural chair of COSIA, which is Canada's oil sands innovation alliance. Judy is a consummate corporate director, and as the former board chair of Alberta Innovates, she led the merger and modernization of four crown corporations into one. Last year, Judy received the first Lifetime Achievement Award from the Calgary Influential Women in Business Organization. And with Judy today is her esteemed colleague, Shelley Kuypers, our serial co-founder. Currently, Shelley is co-founder of The 51 and Adventure Capital. She also leads an ethical consumer engagement company called Iovia, which works with some of the world's largest and most loved brands to create sustainable growth in a world of net zero emissions. And then there's her clothing line called Harris Kuypers, where Shelley is embarking upon a collection of ethically sourced circular sustainable clothing. Leading the conversation with these two remarkable role models is another woman of achievement, Colleen Pound. With over 25 years in industry, including leading her own firm for 18 years, Colleen's career has enabled corporate turnarounds, transitions, and transformations. Recently, Colleen became a consulting partner at Deloitte, focused on continuing to develop the private and mid-markets in the prairies and unlocking their potential. In addition to an outstanding career, Colleen has an equally sterling reputation as a community leader. She serves on the Senate at the University of Calgary and on the Management Advisory Council at Huskane. Previous board work included the Alberta Order of Excellence Council, the Calgary Public Library, the Calgary Women's Center, and the Organization of Women in International Trade. I have no doubt that today's pink tea will be simply outstanding. We hope that you will enjoy it. Colleen, over to you. Thanks so much, Gina, um, and thanks everyone for joining us today. We have a ton of questions for Judy and Shelley, so I'm going to dive right in. Uh, good to see you both, Judy and Shelley. So uh, let's start with the 51. Share with us the story of how you first met each other, what prompted you to establish the 51. Um, talk to us a little bit about your third partner, Alice. Uh, we'd like to know from the very beginning. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the 51 uh, was started uh, in Alberta, very similar to the famous five, which is pretty cool. Um, Alice has been an important connector. We recognized early the untapped potential of the 51, 51 being women as 51% of the population. Our foresight, leadership, um, and particularly, I think, as, as was highlighted uh, earlier, um, were the right kind of leaders. Women are the right kind of leaders for what the 21st century needs and often have been hidden figures and uh, really recognize the opportunity for a new kind of economic diversification. And, and, and you know, and it was lived through lived experience. You know, we've got a fair bit of experience, Shelley and I and, um, and, and Alice, um, in terms of what's possible there. And it starts right from as tech entrepreneurs, as senior business executives, innovators alike. And Shelley can tell some great color on what motivated her. Yeah. Um... You know, the 51 for um, myself, and I think I can speak for Alice too, it, like Judy said, it was based on a, on a lived experience. So as a woman, um, you know, first got my start in the energy uh, industry and then very quickly made a move into tech. And um, like so many industries, you know, you found yourself to be the only woman in the room. Um, and so uh, a big part of uh, the 51 was saying, okay, well, we're here in this room, either as entrepreneurs, corporate leaders, uh, investors, where are the other women? This needs to change. Um, and so, you know, trying not to take our 
maybe our uh, the opportunity that we had and just keep it to ourselves, but how do we really democratize it? And how do we create a platform and a community for others to participate, to fully participate? Um, and so, you know, we went to market uh, with the community uh, to make that happen. But, uh, you know, too many stories had been shared over the years um, of women, you know, trying to raise money successfully and, and mostly unsuccessfully. Um, and then the, the opportunity for investment too, um, you know, not being at the table as a prospective investor. And like Judy said, you know, we have the foresight, we know what needs to be in the world. And so how can we put our capital to work just as much um, as our human capital? Um, and so being at the table as an investor to kind of shape the world we want to see was also, you know, really a big part of 51. That's great. There's, um, you know, so much about what you said, Judy, on the hidden figures, the lived experience, and Shelley, how to take both the human capital and the financial investment. So not unlike the famous five, you're forging the path and pioneering. And, you know, I'd be curious to know, what does it mean to you to have the famous five as important symbols for Canadian women? Well, you know, the mandate of the famous five foundation, and thanks so much for, for, for making this happen, is you know, empower women and girls to courageously lead change. It contributes to society without boundaries for women. And that is absolutely the foundation of, of what we're about as well. And, and I think we're, we're committed to take it to that next level that um, financial feminism is that critical next frontier. Some would say the final frontier. Because when you have investment plus innovation and, you know, Shelley and my backgrounds and, and Alice and our whole community of the 51, we're an amazing group of innovators. You put investment plus innovation together, we have influence on the world we want to see and impact. And uh, that's really what we're standing for in, in terms of, and, and actioning, you know, getting to work, um, building the financial feminist economy. So having, you know, the, particularly from here, being from Alberta, the famous five on our shoulders to help lift us up, not just ourselves, but the whole, the 51 community, is incredibly motivating and it just propels us. Wonderful. Thank you. Shelly, anything to add there? Good. Okay. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that, that notion of, um, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats. Um, and so, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, the 51 and your benchmarks for success, how you're measuring your own progress and, and what your definition of success looks like for, for all those listening. Yeah, exactly. And maybe what I'll do is I'll just touch on what were the macro um, statistics that really got us going. Um, and I think um, we've we've shared this more broadly across our community. Uh, but when we got the 51 going, uh, it was clearly documented that only 2.8% of all global VC funding went to women. 2.8%. And when we looked at you know the the demographics of the 51% behind that 2.8%. Um, you know, women were being even further marginalized. If you were a black woman, if you were an indigenous woman, if you were from the LGBT community, so that was the that was the statistic first and foremost that really uh, got us fired up. We were like, this needs to change. If we look at last year and a record breaking uh, venture capital year, we actually took a step back. Women got less venture capital last year, so we dropped to two point two percent. And again. You know, 2.8 to 2.2 doesn't sound like a lot. It is a lot to 51% of the population. So at a macro level, that's uh, the statistic that we're trying to change. What's really cool about being in Alberta um, is that women uh, co-found or co-lead or are the leaders of technology companies at twice the national average of Canada. So I think we're sitting, I can think the current statistic is 28%. Uh, the rest of Canada is between 12 and 15%. So Alberta is leading the charge in women leading in tech, which is fantastic. Um, but again, you know, as Judy and I, as you might kind of surmise from us already, we're very ambitious. We want to keep punching that number up. Um, and then even more broadly, we know that that statistic drops off. So there are a lot of women starting companies in Alberta, but do we have the staying power? Can we build growth companies? And that statistic drops um, after just a few years. And so at a macro level, that those are the things and the statistics that we were 
really inspired by to, to start the 51. And the, and the other thing that comes on top of this is numerous studies that show women-led entrepreneurial businesses and, and writ large outperform. So, you know, up to, up to 60% better than, than, you know, and this gets to this point around diversity, women-led. Um, there is a business case for it. There's a business opportunity to unlock the capital and talent of the 51%. You know, I think, and inside our inside the fifty one as well. What's really important to us is is our community, how that's resonating, um, and 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 the experience is resonating. Um, that we're putting the capital to work, the number of members that we have, how people are getting engaged, and and of, and of course the sustainability of it in terms of the dollars we're able to bring in the door. Um, you know, and we're structured as as we'll get to shortly. You know, as uh, an entrepreneurial entity, a fund and a not-for-profit movement, all necessary to drive the change. That's great. It, you know, Judy, I was um, just the combination of what Shelley uh, and, and you just said around um, women make great investment targets. Um, they're successful. It reminded me of Mohammed Yunus and the Grameen Bank earlier on about lending to women because they always had their loans repaid um, and those stories that need to be told. And so what did the early uh, planning for this startup look like? How is it structured? Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of complex moving parts and pieces and you bring different skill sets to the table. We'd love to know a little bit more about that. Yeah. And I think there was... There was a few kind of pivotal moments for us. Um, you know, Judy, Alice, and I, you know, we've been leaders in our own communities over the decades now. <laughs> We're getting up there, um, Alice being the youngest of us. But, you know, I think one of the things that we looked at initially was, um, do we try to change the existing system? Do we um, keep asking um, the existing venture uh, community to change their statistics. Um, and we did, we did that for many years. Like, I don't know, Judy, I don't know how many years it was for you, but it was many years uh, for myself. Um, and, you know, we decided that we weren't going to ask for those statistics to be changed by others, but instead create a solution for ourselves that we designed for ourselves, but we knew would be for many others. Um, and so that's really at the heart of the 51, is we said, we can complain about it, or we can do something about it, and we can provide a solution. And so um, that was a really pivotal moment. I think there was a road trip to Palo Alto. That was a really pivotal moment for us, yeah, where we were indeed. like, that's <laughs> not what we're going to do. Um, and so we came back to to Calgary and we said, okay, that was not the inspiration that we were looking for. So what is our model? Uh, but I think thirdly, what we did was we just got to work. Like we didn't have an incorporation. We didn't have anything incorporated. Um, we just got into a boardroom on a regular basis and said, what are we gonna do? What does this look like? Uh, you know, we need a brand, we need a name. What's the very first thing that we should be doing? Um, you know, how do we start you know, getting this group of women together. Um, okay, let's do it in somebody's kitchen. And so uh, very practically we got going. Um, and I think, you know, that's really part of the entrepreneur spirit, right? There was nobody and nothing holding us back. And so we just got to work, we did the work and here we are, you know, two years later. And like Judy said, you know, we've, we're incorporated. Uh, we've got a not-for-profit, we've set up a fund. Um, but I think what we've done is we've built the necessary structure in the organization based on where we're at. Um, and so, you know, can we confirm from the market that they want something from us? Yes or no? Okay, let's build it. And then what's the necessary infrastructure to put in place to make it happen? And the 51 is all of us. I mean, we've got over 12,000 um, in our community globally, not globally. Uh, 104 investors across Canada, um, numerous members with us in terms of hundreds of members with us in financial feminism, really advancing their finan financial uh, acumen. Um, it's the whole community. Two, when you said two years, 
I can't believe that it's only been two years. I'm sure for you, it must feel like a blink of an eye and then also forever. Um, and so it's kind so of a bit of both, Colleen. It feels, <laughs> it feels <laughs> long and very fast. Right. There's, and, some, there's some COVID years in there. <laughs> well, and what's neat is our big, our, our COVID, you know, it's very, very challenging and it's been so hard for so many. And certainly we've had a lot on our plates too. Um, and, and respect all um, what everyone's dealing with. It's actually helped us be uh, to even accelerate. From March 2020 on, we are totally virtual. Our team has been built and we have an amazing team of, of women from different walks of life um, and backgrounds and, and the like. And, and it, we, we work virtually and at a, at a fast pace. And I think that is the world of entrepreneurs in the 21st century. I, I agree. A huge thanks to the team. <laughs> That's um, and and just even building the team, picking the right people. I mean, two years later, twelve thousand investors worldwide. Um, ideally, you know, some more investors on this call uh, because financial feminism is for everyone. Um, and uh, and you know, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the value proposition for investing in the fifty one as investors. What the current composition is, how you'd like to see it evolve. Um, you know, I, I, I won't give an overt plug about how people can contact you. I'll leave that to you. But I mean, definitely it's it's to get educated, create awareness, get interested and get involved. So love to know more. Well, it starts with, you know, building the financial feminism economy. And, you know, the fact that, again, you know, statistics show that by the end of the decade, 2030 in Canada, women are going to be controlling two thirds of the wealth. We're already 80, making 85% of the consumer decisions. What often holds women back, I think, is we don't think we know enough, you know, in terms, especially on the financial and commercial side. And what's been so neat is as we've come together as a group, we teach each other. And the expertise of, you, know, you don't have to all know it all yourself. You learn from each other. And that's a lot of the value proposition here. A lot of, you know, particularly in the financial world, there's a lot of jargon. And women are smart. Um, and, and what part of the value proposition is knowing that, you know, it's an economic imperative to, to be comfortable in terms of managing, you know, eat my daughter, you know, she's going into grade 10, they are teaching them around financial acumen. It starts, you know, we, we all, women have to all be, um, in, in strong position to do that. And sometimes we hold ourselves back. So we offer that platform to get involved learn from others. And when you're ready, you're in what's called an accredited investor, where there's sort of, sort of certain milestones in terms of your wealth, because early stage investing in venture capital is risky. You know, it, uh, these, are, these are not liquid investments like right on the public exchanges. However, it gives you the opportunity to shape the kind of future that you wanna see, the kind of companies you want to see. Um, and so it's that opportunity to do that at a level where you learn, where you can do it at a reasonable dollar level so that it's not risking too much of your portfolio and do it in, in a wonderful community. In terms of our investment group, we have over 100 investors in, in, in Canada. The 12,000 number is, is our global community of, of fact, those gaining financial acumen. What's super neat is our community of investors is 90% women. And, you know, we've activated uh, over $16 million in terms of a group of investors that came together first. And then when we came together formally incorporated under the fund. Um, and uh, again, 90% of our investors are women across Canada. And they're executives and directors in many prominent sectors. You know many of them, you know, banking, private equity, but telecom, agriculture, utilities, energy. I'm, there's many, many sectors, doctors, teachers, serial entrepreneurs an amazing, amazing group. That's a, that is, a, it's a, it's a huge group and very inspiring. And so like, how does it work? Do you seek companies uh, out to invest in or respond to those who ask you to do so? Like how, how would a, a female founder, um, you know, connect to you in order to get involved with the 51? So, uh, Many entrepreneurs come to us now, and, and there's referrals from other, many others uh, in the ecosystem, Creative Destruction Lab, you know, many, many places. We've actually now spoken and had in-depth conversations with over 225 women-led or co-led companies. That's an awful lot, and awful lot of, of discussions, which is awesome. And we've invested in 10 through the fund, 15 before that as co-investors. We're mentoring, you know, couple dozen companies uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, 
and uh, as well as what we do through crowdfunding and, and front funder um, and 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 they are coming to us you know what we are consisting here and shelly can highlight further is it's important to them to the room we one yesterday with, with a great founder and she said this is the first time i have actually um pitched you know for, provided an overview of my company to an all-woman table first time and this was a woman that had worked in silicon valley and is now based in Toronto. It was like, wow. And she said, this is a very special experience for me. So it, it, there's that wow. pull. Yeah, it's it's wow. And it's also highly disappointing, right? Like like it's amazing and just demonstrates the need um, for, for what you're doing. And also at the same time, how the heck did it take this long? <laughs> I, I know, Shelly, you were going to add in as well. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's an important point. Um, that it's so rare to be, you know, presenting to um, a, a team of women. Um, but what we're also hearing from these entrepreneurs is, uh, you know, women funding them is even more challenging. So it goes back to Judy's point, right? Um, yes, it's now it's kind of in vogue to invest in women, right? Um, and so uh, we really need to um, activate our community um, of investors to participate in this uh, investing experience. And so it's rare. Um, and then still um, we're being held back for some strange reason. Um, and I think a big part of that is, you know, it's still very much uh, on the investing side. It's, it's an exclusive um, sport, right? Uh, and so we're really trying to democratize that from the investor side and from the entrepreneur side, right? Let's use plain language when we talk. Um, exactly. Let's, you know, we talk about, we have a financial feminist dictionary where we really take all of these terms, you know, all of these terms that we're using um, in kind of the finance context and breaking them down and actually just defining them in, in plain language um, so that we can fully participate and understand. Um, and so again, uh, you know, we are being approached by, by women for funding, which is fantastic. We get, like Judy said, we're getting references from everywhere. People contact us directly. Um, you know, we're kind of inundated, which is a, is a good problem to have, right? Um, but that also means that we're not going to be the only solution in the market, right? And so collaboration is really key for us. We, yes, we do collaborate with the venture capital ecosystem. We do collaborate with other organizations, just like the 51. We're not the sole solution. You're, you're, not, the, you're not the sole solution. However, you've made such a, a huge impact, especially in the last two years, to create that momentum and to prove that there's a market and prove that there's an appetite. And you're really, it's, it is that pioneering aspect. And so what advice do you have for an entrepreneur that's looking for investment from the 51? What are the critical success factors or common pain points that you see and maybe some advice that you have to avoid those pitfalls or help them be successful in their pursuit of capital? Yeah, great, great question. And as I bridge to that, I think building on Shelley's point of, of we're not, we can't be everything to everybody, right? We, we have already that we can focus on and really rely on many, many um, in the system. And the sectors we're focusing on, um, uh, just for a little bit of color there, is sustainable, um, sustainable food and ag tech, um, fintech and e-commerce platforms, and health and femtech. So again, health, um, particularly as it may focus to solutions for women who are very much underserved, I think, through history. So we focus on the, those areas. We may provide many referrals to others. Um, we do talk to entrepreneurs that are more broad from that. I have a deep clean tech background, you know, relating to the source sector, love to make referrals. Um, and, you know, often if we're going to give advice early on, um, it's always done from a position of caring because it is so hard to be an entrepreneur. This is a tough, tough journey takes a lot of courage. And what we try to share with them, and Shell's got so much experience to share, is, is um, the importance of acting versus trying to be perfect. So that hustle, um, you can use a different word for that. And, and that you're gonna run into things where things don't go well. Just take it in stride and it learn and, and iterate. Um, and then, you know, don't worry about being embarrassed, like just, just run with it. And then the other thing I would say that we've run into a lot, Shell, is, women CEOs will come to us and they'll say, oh, well, I'm not the one that knows the financial or the commercial stuff. I'll have to defer to a guy on that or somebody else. And, and hence, you know, really what's key 
as a woman CEO is getting comfortable with that. Knowing you, you can know it, it's just jargon. And we really try to embrace our founders in, in that aspect and, and uh, to help them scale up. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the other um, a piece of advice is uh, you're, you were always raising money. If you are a growth business and you're a venture um, business, you are always raising money. Um, and you might, uh, you know, not be closing, you know, some financing right now, but, you know, as a CEO, you are always selling. You are selling to investors, you're selling to customers, you're selling to potential teammates. Um, so that whole idea of, you know, uh, being a CEO and a leader and having uh, those sk sales skills is, is super important. That actually provides a really nice bridge, Shelly, into my next question around, um, so sales, yes, and also marketing, which I know you have a, a deep background in. So unlike many other venture cap companies, you have an active and phenomenal social media presence. Can you tell us a little bit about um, that, the motivation, how it's come to be, and, and what you're loving about it? Yeah, um, and I, I think uh, it's a great question, Colleen. It goes back to what we said at the beginning. Um, the 51 was never meant to be an investment club or something exclusive for just a few. And so we knew uh, from the onset that we had to create a community. Well, how best to create a community, right? Um, yes, we can all get in a room together. We've had some fantastic events in Calgary uh, where our community has come together, um, but not everyone can physically get together. And then COVID even further accelerated that. So the use of social media has really been a way for us to build our community. Um, and not anybody participate um, from the touch of their phone. Um, this morning, uh, Judy and I hosted our weekly Instagram uh, TV show. Um, and, you know, anybody can view into that from their phone. And so we really tried to make the 51 super, super accessible. Uh, we leverage um, other technology platforms as well. But we want, we want our community to have a voice in the 51. And so... Uh, yes, that means listen, listening to us on social media, but we also want you to participate. And we've now rolled out a membership, very accessible membership. It's $51 a year for you to come in and participate and become a financial feminist in our digital platform. So again, you know, using those technologies uh, to build a community was really important, making what we're doing really important. Um, you know, we didn't want to be perceived as, uh, you know, just like another venture firm. In fact, we wanted to work, you know, to the complete opposite. That's um, the social media, uh, what you've talked about around creating community accessibility and the voice is um, that's, you know, there's some of the pillars of everything that we've heard from you so far. We're going to take a quick break now. And we have two um, young ladies who have uh, questions. Grace and Amy each have a question. So Grace, we'll start with you. Hi, my name is Grace and I just graduated high school and I'm really excited to be attending U of T next fall for engineering science. And I'm really interested in the biomedical specialization. As a young woman in entrepreneurship, I feel very accepted and welcomed into the entrepreneurial community. It is the many female role models in my life that I have to thank for both initiating and fostering this. I know though that not all young women have these role models, which is why I wanted to ask the panel how you think technology could enable an increased connection between women in different generations, as well as between young women in the same generation. Thanks so much both for your time. Grace, so awesome to have you on today. Um, another very, very strong voice from, from Calgary that's shaping the way for women. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about uh, Joy to Jobs. In terms of tech, one of the things I think that's been so uh, liberating has been virtual. And, you know, as we said, we've built our community of over 12,000 of all generations, different parts of the world, um, all on, on, on social platforms. And, you know, people chime in on 10 a.m. Mountain Instagram TV from all over the place. And, and you know, we, we share, I think, um, a lot of common desires on what we want our world to be. And uh, I would hope that because we have a common desire there, that helps bridge us across generations to create a better world. And I think on the specific tech side, um, Shell's probably got some great suggestions there. Not really. Not really. Uh, that was a great question. Um, 
you know, really, uh, you know, use it, utilizing the, the digital technologies that we have around us to really break down those, those barriers. Um, like Judy said, we have, you know, all generations, it's a global community, anybody can participate. Um, and so, yeah, I think digital technologies, yes, um, you know, there's the, there's the part of them that we're not always enamored with, but uh, in the case of the 51, they've been extremely valuable. And, um, and I think that's where women can find their role models. They may never even talk with a role model, but, um, you know, they can fully participate and, and be inspired by women around the world doing amazing things. Great. Uh, thanks, Grace, for that question. And now we'll move on to Amy. Hi, I'm, a re I'm Amy, and I'm a recent graduate from the University of Winnipeg Collegiate. In the fall, I will be studying physics and mathematics at the University of Toronto, with the intention of starting my own tech startup someday. All three of the panelists today have had very successful careers in business. I'm curious how they have managed to reconcile feminism with business, given the patriarchal history of business. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Shell? <Chell? laughs> I love that question. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Thank you. I think that uh, that is one of the key reasons why women are becoming entrepreneurs, you know, at faster rates all the time. Um, you know, we're the fastest growing segment um, of entrepreneurs. Um, and so we are redesigning, you know, what business can look like. I think women have been in the forefront of, you know, bringing um, social and commercial together. Um, you know, we, we can build different companies, we can build different cultures. Um, so I think, you know, the 51 is, is representative of that. We created a financial feminist organization. Um, we we chose a very different path. And I think uh, women entrepreneurs are, are doing just that. Um, if we then look at, um, you know, we have um, members inside of our community that are corporate leaders. Um, and so we, you know, we still want to have the ability to influence those corporations that they work at. And so, you know, uh, Judy and I are actually working on a, on a new offering where we can take uh, our memberships into these corporates, right? And, and help them, you know, become a financial feminist organization as well. And so this idea of, um, you know, creating net new through entrepreneurship and through women leadership, but then also taking that same leadership that we all have inside of the companies that we're already working at and helping reshape them uh, to be a more, you know, equitable uh, work environment um, that's something else that we're working on. So yes, we always have more ideas. Um, and, uh, your question is fantastic because it's, it's, it's very much at the heart of, of what the work that we're doing. Yeah. Excellent answer. And if I have just briefly on that, if I look back in my career, collective action, like many of the things in my bio that were mentioned that I'm most proud of is where we brought people from different worlds, different organizations, entrepreneurs, corporates, governments, um, all different backgrounds together because collective action drives change. And one of the things I think it's fascinating about your point around feminist principles is I think we do work collectively and that will help us to really uh, influence the kind of world we want to see. And one of the things I think it's neat about both of you is you're going into STEM careers. Um, and as I reflect, I'm an engineer with an MBA. Engineers solve problems. Entrepreneurs solve problems. And I think, you know, what's so critical and your, your role models yourself is that you're embracing creating the kind of world that you want to see, creating solutions that have social and environmental progress. And uh, I'm just going to be cheering you on and please stay in touch. I agree, uh, you know, wonderful um, to hear from you, Grace and Amy, and thanks so much for those insightful questions. The time is going by so fast. Um, we, uh, I, I, I'm gonna try to cut down some of my remaining 15 questions that I have. <laughs> and so, um, you know, a couple on kind of Judy and Shelley, the early years, and then want to leave, leave some time to talk about thinking about the future. So. Um, you know, very curious to know what your earliest memory was of being interested in entrepreneurship and, and technology and that start of your journey and maybe how it's tied into your, your journey more recently. Yeah, uh, maybe I'll just jump in real quick. Um, like I said, I got my start in oil and gas. Um, 
but I had this extraordinary opportunity where I was, you know, my very first job, I was thrown into a computer lab and I was told to learn all of the software that was in this computer lab. Um, and for me, it was like, wow, okay, this is where my creative side can really come to life, right? So like Judy, I, you know, I initiated an engineering path. Um, I rubbed against it madly. Um, I was then, uh, you know, in an engineering environment, but software for me was just like, wow, this is so creative. Look at the systems and the solutions that people can design to do work differently. And so for me, that was my, my earliest memory of like, okay, I am, I'm going all in on tech. Um, and I did from, from that point forward. Shelly had a lot of foresight there. For me, and I decided in grade 12 with a lot of encouraging because I was strong in math and sciences to go into engineering. Um, and then I remember being a summer student, you know, and, and I didn't get this kind of prestigious summer job, but I got one where they said, we need to figure out a system where the, where the operators in the field don't have to do all these manual ports. Can you figure it out? Like our team hasn't been able to figure it out. So I grabbed an Apple IIe computer and taught myself how to code and built that to be automated over the antiquated phone lines at the time. And that was kind of my first start at innovating and, and, and it was cool. And then throughout being as an engineer, being able to work with the team, develop major technologies for sustainability. Um, um, Michael Porter, when I was doing my MBA, you know, green and competitive, I remember reading his paper and going, this is the future. You know, businesses have to be green and have to be competitive and they're gonna get there by being green and done many things since then along that lane, land of sustainability and embracing technology. Wonderful. I just have this view of you with your early Apple computer and then <laughs> and then the sound of dial-up whirring in the background. <laughs> yeah, I'm that old. <laughs> Uh, as am I. So, um, so you know that that's that's a phenomenal uh, kind of visual. And so, um, you know, I guess I'll ask one last question about kind of the early years, and then we'll talk about the future. Uh, curious to know, um, you, you talked a little bit about you know working as a woman, um, you know, in tech or in oil and gas. Um, what uh, what moments stood out to you, and what about technology has kind of spurred on that passion, your ability to do things? Like what, what's, really, what's really gotten you excited about that path forward? Shell? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I, I, I wanna share an entrepreneur story, but I, maybe it's a precursor to that. I think what's been phenomenal about the tech space is that anything is possible. Um, like you can build anything today. I mean, you know, uh, earlier, you know, anything wasn't possible, but I just found, you know, tech in its, in its way was highly democratized. Yes, it, you know, it has its history of, you know, not being an inclusive environment, but the actual building um, what you want um, is accessible to anybody. I mean, Judy was coding, right? I was like, I was coding, um, you know, languages to to build um you know economic analysis of oil and gas right it was like and you just you just learn how to do it um but what i wouldn't mind doing is introducing uh an, a woman that uh, judy and i have personally um invested in um as well as the 51 fund and her name is bobby reset she's one of our portfolio companies uh, Bobby is, uh, is a leader in so many ways, um, and she is the founder and CEO of a company called Virtual Gurus. And Virtual Gurus is uh, a virtual community um, and now a technology platform. So, you know, her, her ambition and her vision is being executed over time. Um, but I can go to Virtual Gurus and I can say, I need somebody, uh, a virtual assistant to do this or an expert to do this. And I can hire on demand or on an ongoing basis, someone from her community. Um, and what was really cool is Bobby designed this company uh, based on her own lived experience again. And that's what I think is so powerful about entrepreneurship is, you know, Bobby um, lost her job in oil and gas as an administrator couldn't find work, couldn't find good paying work, like living wage work. And so she created virtual gurus um, and then she just started building a community that was bigger and bigger and bigger of other 
uh, people like her that needed work. Um, and today, Bobby, you know, really focuses on hiring um, into her community and recruiting to her community. Those that would typically be underemployed or not utilized. So it, it could be, you know, I'm a mom from home. I'm in an Indigenous community. Um, you know, I'm not well understood by a work environment, but I can do my work from home. Um, and so Bobby has built up this phen phenomenal community um, of virtual gurus, uh, that's the name, um, and now is expanding uh, the platform and the community to utilize AI. Uh, but I think Bobby is really an example um, of an entrepreneurial leader um, from our community uh, that typifies a business that is um, extremely valuable. Her her valuation, uh, Judy, you could correct me, um, but you know, has gone up five times over the last year and a half. Um, it's growing uh, at a tremendous rate, um, but it, is a, it isn't just a, a valuable company. It drives so much impact uh, and brings employment to those that maybe wouldn't otherwise be employed. Um, and so we just wanted to bring her story into this discussion. We want everyone to go check out Virtual Gurus and, and follow Bobby because she's a truly an inspiration. And, and, and she's getting recognized. You know, the um, Globe and Mail report on business, she's one of Canada's top change makers. Um, and she's just named one of the top 10 Indigenous leaders in, in Canada. Um, and so she is a real role model of what's possible when you say, hey, there's a challenge here. I'm going to find a solution and you build it for a community and it works. Um, and she gives back a lot too. So another excellent story of what's coming out of Alberta. Well, and I just love how you are modeling your values, even in this form, by taking the voice and the platform that you have and lending that voice and that platform to, to a female founder led uh, business that you've invested in. It's just, it completes that ecosystem. Um, so when we think about the future, um, and I know I'm gonna invite Francis on in a few moments, what are the opportunities for the 51 going forward into the future? And, and um, you know, your key messages for, uh, women, younger, older, what would you say to them? What's your encouraging call to action? Yeah, um, we have a big vision. Um, and sometimes, you know, we're told to temper it. And then I'm like, no, we're not gonna temper it. We're gonna keep going. Um, but when we started the 51, we had 2030 in our sights from the start. The year we weren't thinking yeah. one year or two year or three years. Um, and when we did the research and we saw the wealth transfer statistic, we said, it's our time. Um, and so, uh, you know, we have uh, a big ambition to, to activate women's capital over this decade. And we've got a very large number in mind. Uh, but we know, you know, that it's not going to only happen through a, a venture fund structure. Um, you know, we will have a family of venture funds, but how can we further democratize women's participation in this ecosystem? Um, and we often say, you know, look at your spending power as your capital, um, not just your spending power. Um, how are you making decisions about where you put your spending dollars? Which companies are you supporting? Because in essence, what you're doing is you're financing them by spending with them. And so, um, you know, when we talk about activating uh, your capital, we talk everything from consumer spending to the, you know, the capital that you might be investing as well. You know, we talked about uh, us as corporate leaders. How are we influencing these supply chains to be more reflective um, of the suppliers and the partnerships that we want to have? And so, you know, we want to see women's capital, uh, both human and financial, to be, uh, to be influencing all of, all of those aspects. And, and, I, and I would just add, I think sometimes in Canada, we underplay ourselves. And Canada is actually one of the hottest innovation ecosystems in Alberta in particular in terms of momentum right now. And so it's important for us to be bold and to know, um, you know, take that goal and go for it. Absolutely. And, you know, to, as we said earlier, you know, in, in our case of building a financial feminism economy, you know, when you have investment and you put some skin in the game, plus you think innovative, like we're going to have impact and influence. Well, you are, you already are, and I mean, I think even just the statistic about we're we're at the double of the national rate uh, at twenty eight percent here is is phenomenal, and I love the notion of voting with your wallet. I remember one of my first investment lessons was 
I think about the products and services that you already use on a regular basis and, you know, invest in those companies because you already, you're already investing. You in already them. know them. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right? Yeah. You know, like, like why did we invest in that Lululemon years ago? Exactly. Exactly. So what, what, what are we investing in now? Um, and, uh, and, and, and so many others and, and local, right? I think that's one thing that we talked, we've talked about here is what, what uh, companies, what restaurants, what retail stores do you really want to make sure are here post pandemic and how are you supporting them uh, financially? And so the voting with your wallet is key. And I, I love the momentum. So um, we're going to uh, invite Francis uh, back to join us. And, um, and I think she's going to ask us a couple questions. I sure am, although I've loved this past hour, all the things I've learned and the confidence or the optimism about women playing a bigger role and having the money to play a bigger role too. So Judy and Shelley and Colleen, thank you very, very much. So normally I do a consolidation of uh, the questions that are asked by the guests as they register, but we have covered them today. So I'm just going to go right into the famous five lightning round of questions where I make a brief statement and then ask you in two or three words to respond. So the first statement is, which I'd like all three of you to answer is, when I am confused or I don't know what to do, I dot, dot, dot. Shelly? Reach out to someone else. <laughs> oh, okay, Shelly? Uh, I go for a walk in the forest. Oh, very nice. Colleen? Uh, I meditate and I process externally. Yeah, I, I definitely chat with others. So I think I'm a little bit of column A, column B. Thank you. The next one is when I am scared, when I'm frightened. I dot, dot, dot. Judy? Uh, I love Eleanor Roosevelt's quote, do one thing every day that scares you. And that gives me the momentum to take it on. That makes you braver, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Shelley. Yeah, I think I'm. I'm the same. Um, I kind of like that. I like the energy of of not knowing everything all the time. Um, and so I, I think I kind of thrive in a bit of fear. I would say again, if I'm really sad though, again, I'm gonna head back into that forest. And Colleen. I think I. I, if it's something scary, I'll, I'll take a deep breath and, and do it anyway. And it usually turns out better than I would have thought. Um, I also am a planner. So if I'm trying to control or mitigate something, then I'll invest a lot of time in scenario planning. So those are my two. And that we saw in space today, Colleen, with a skillful way that you led this discussion. So thank you. So the last lightning question is something that Shelley just touched on. So we'll go to Shelley first. When I'm sad. When I'm depressed, I'm I sorry, I got, it. yeah, I got, it. um, yeah, like give me a forest. That is like my answer for so many things. Or I, I put my headphones on and I listen to some music that can really take me to a different place. And then before COVID, I would have always just gone on a plane and gone someplace else. <laughs> oh, thank you, Judy. Uh, nature, friends, family, and sleep. I find that if you don't get enough sleep, it can be a solver for so many challenges. Absolutely. In fact, that was one of the questions I was going to ask is, when did the three of you sleep? <laughs> All the things you're doing and you're thinking about doing, my gosh. So Colleen, when I'm sad, I... Yeah, I'm, I'm with Judy. Everything looks good after a nap. It's a whole new day. So um, yeah, like friends, baking, uh, music, but definitely uh, the world looks different after a nap. Lots of good options there. And the last one, one, is if the famous five were alive today, they would dot, dot, dot. Judy? Be financial feminists. Yeah, totally. <laughs> That's right. We would, well, say, so we would both financial, say that. We would both say that. Why financial feminists and not entrepreneurs? Well, it's, it's, all, it's all encompassing. Go, it's all encompassing. Okay, thank you. Shelly? Yeah, no, I would say the same as they would be financial feminists. You know, we say uh, financial feminism is one of the last frontiers of feminism. Um, you know, equality in in uh, the financial ecosystem. So uh, that's I would I totally agree. Yeah, I'm, I think you've got a very good answer there. 
I'm slightly biased towards what you're saying, but Colleen, what would the Famous Five do if they were alive today? Uh, I think that they would be the biggest investors into the 51. <laughs> <laughs> and having their say. What's that, Francis? And having their say. Having right. their say, Absolutely. driving the agenda forward. I loved Shelley's comment about um, it's really about democratizing uh, women and our access. And I think that that is the value proposition that would ring clear for them most. Yeah. Well, what a remarkable conversation today. Financial knowledge, increase in democracy, giving courage, giving good examples, giving steps. I mean, it was all there. So while we're at a pink tea today, and as you all know, pink teas are when women come together to talk about their lives, to examine some of the problems, and then to come up with some solutions and do it together. So um, that was originally used to get women the right to vote and run for office. But today we're doing it to honor women coming together and solving problems and learning from incredible role models like we've had today. So I hope you've all brought a teacup or you have a glass of water or wine um, handy. And we'd like to begin by toasting, of course, the 51 and Judy and Shelley, who are truly trailblazers, uh, trailblazers in a number of different fields, both as successful tech entrepreneurs and now as tech leaders and not that they went before, but in terms of the actual investment. So thank you very much for um, developing even, you said, a feminist director, a uh, feminist dictionary. Oh, fantastic. So let's raise our glass to Shelley and to uh, Judy and say thank you very much for being an incredible leader. To thank you, Famous Five and the whole 51 community. Oh, thank you. And, and if you want to know more, um, www.the51.com. <laughs> or I.O. The 51.com. Okay, thank you. Thank and of you. course, our second toast is to Colleen, who exemplified, you, who exemplified her brilliance and the, uh, the diligence that she put into researching the, um, the company and the individuals and then how to bring it all together and, and bring up the salient points. So Colleen, thank you for being a longtime supporter of the Famous Five and the Famous Five Foundation and for all the work that you are doing and with your new position with Deloitte. So to another leader, to Colleen. Thank you, Colleen. And now a toast to end our toast to the three other role models that we had today, to Gina Jordan from Enbridge with her new responsibilities and to the two remarkable young'uns um, I think they're both 18 and off to the University of Toronto um, to Grace and to Amy. Our future is so bright. And thank you so much, Judy, for introducing us to Grace, who then introduced us to Amy. So to Gina, to Grace and to Amy, thank you very much for being outstanding leaders. And now... I'm going to ask our talented AV group to take the program participants off while I just uh, spend a couple of minutes talking about the Famous Five Foundation and some of the news that uh, I think you might be interested in. The first thing is the Famous Five Foundation was launched 25 years ago. Doesn't seem possible. 25 years ago on October 18th, 1996, when we set out to acknowledge the role, the contributions that women had played in the building of Canada as we came to the end of a decade, a century, and a millennium. And so we have grown, and now as we come up to this October, we want to celebrate the 25th anniversary. So if you have ideas about what we could do that would inspire more women to be leaders, we would greatly appreciate it. And of course, October um, 18th is also the 92nd anniversary of the person's case, and if you live in Alberta, it is also election day. And those of us who live in Calgary are hoping that after the close of voting, that we might have a female mayor. So stay tuned for that and be sure to remember when you're voting, who is it that worked very hard, got burnt in effigy, often had their meetings destroyed because they were advocating for women to have the right to vote. On October 13th, another Famous Five Friday, 
we're going to meet a Renaissance woman in the personage of the Honorable Vivian Poy. Vivian is a fashion designer, retailer, manufacturer. She's a PhD historian. She is particularly, um, we are particularly grateful to Vivian because she was one of the five uh, women who came forward to fund the Women Are Persons Monument. And subsequently, Vivian accepted our challenge to work with Canadians to restore the anthem to its natural or its original inclusiveness so that we now sing True Patriot Love in all of us command, in all of us command. So that's on August the 13th with uh, Vivian. But we're also going to talk amongst the celebrations about the increase in racism for Asian women. And on December, I'm uh, sorry, on September 10th, it'll be um, Chantal Petitclerc. She is the most decorated para Olympian in Canada. And now she is also a senator. So she will have some fascinating comments uh, following, of course, the Tokyo Olympics and um, also what's happening with the Senate and her particular interest in accessibility because uh, Colleen spends most of her time now in a wheelchair. So that's on September the 10th. But now just one last toast and that's to each and every one of us because to somebody, each and every one of us is a leader. And I'm sure for the panel today, to many, many people, they are the leaders. So in a strong, clear voice, please toast yourself. Say to me, I am a leader too. So to me, I am a leader too. So thank you everyone for joining us today. It was a spectacular hour. We look forward to seeing you in just a month's time on another Famous Five Friday. And uh, we celebrate all the breakthroughs that have happened in the last little while. And I've just been told the first woman to be a base camp petty officer has been appointed by the Canadian Navy. Her name is uh, Alina Modelli. So the first woman to be a chief base petty officer in Canada in the Navy. So we're, we're making strides. So now I'm going to turn you over to Carolyn Harley who's going to sing the spirit of the famous five. Merci, miigwech, thank you, bye-bye. See you. Hello everyone. My name is Carolyn Harley. I'm a singer-songwriter, storyteller, and late bloomer. So 25 years ago, I wrote a song called The Ballad of the Famous Five. And I wrote it to celebrate the struggle that the Famous Five went through to finally win the person's case. And that winning decision back in 1929 changed the definition of the word person in the BNA Act so that the definition would include women. And with that decision, women were given legal status, an amazing accomplishment for the women of the day. But I got thinking about all the heartache that's going on in the world now that needs our attention. I got thinking of all the things that still need to be accomplished. And so I wrote a second song and I call this song, The Spirit of the Famous Five. And it's a call to action song. It's a song that invites us to follow in the footsteps, the courageous footsteps of the Famous Five and to find ways that we can set aside our differences and work together to make the changes that are necessary for equality and respect for every member of our human community. So this is my song called The Spirit of the Famous Five. Five women fought the system A system they knew was wrong wouldn't take no for an answer They believed they belong It was an uphill battle It seemed they could not win Five women stood together Swore they never would give in The power of their conviction Still echoes through the years Truth was always on their side. 
side Truth will always win Five women stood together Swore they never would give in Can you feel the fire burning From the torch they held high To guide us through the ages the need to take that torch and keep the flame alive if you do they have passed to you the spirit of the famous fire their work is still not finished the world is still unjust when we their spirit says we must The secret of their power To find the courage to begin Five women stood together Swore they never would give in And can you feel the fire burning From the torch they held high Heroes of Mine, The Famous Five.